Welcome to Revelator Alpha for another live show on two wheels. Uh, so uh, I'm live from the man cave. I am at home for the next four days, uh, duty bound to stay uh, within the confines of my four walls or four shed walls uh, at least. And uh, hopefully you're doing the same. Now, uh, I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, Harley Davidson's, of course, uh, but uh, the company, a uh, bit of news coming out of the company, or lack of, I suppose. I've been qu getting quite a few uh, comments and uh, emails from lots of you as well, asking uh, different questions about different things. Uh, and then we're going to sort of end the uh, show, the live show, uh, with a bit of a, a little quiz, a little cheeky quiz for you, another 10 roaring questions. So if you just join in now, uh, then, uh, you know, join in. Uh, but if you're just watching later, then obviously uh, just uh, answer away and just enjoy the video for what it is. Uh, I'll also put this on the podcast as well, so you can uh, watch uh, or listen to this, I should say, uh, via uh, SoundCloud, Spotify, or iTunes, or you can access that uh via the website you can see the little ticker tape uh, beneath here and that's uh there there's a website revelatealf.com and uh, don't forget to like share subscribe tell all your friends join in the chat let us know where you are in the world and uh, also if you're able to ride your motorcycles if you're not uh or any kind of restrictions that you've got going in if you're watching this later leave comments let us know uh where you're at and what your thoughts are and by all means, ask as many questions as you want, and uh, we'll get this thing going. Okay, so I'm not really going to uh, be talking about you know the global crisis per se. I'm going to be talking about, uh, incidentally, how it's affecting everybody, and obviously in motorcycle terms and what I ride, and and also kind of the news out there. So let's just get over some of the news first of all. Uh, one of the things that uh, Many people were asking me uh, and or highlighted uh, to me uh, again uh, that the Harley Davidson factories uh, have closed. Uh, that's actually very similar to many other factories around the world, as we know. Uh, now, the uh, Harley Davidson closed down their factories uh, in the United States because uh, one or two, I believe, uh, of their employees had tested positive for COVID-19. They were supposed to reopen on the 29th, as we stand today, which is the 30th, so it's supposed to open up yesterday. Uh, we believe that hasn't happened. And we also know that in the United States, they've extended uh, their restrictions until the end of April uh, now, I believe, as well. So whilst Donald Trump was very enthusiastic about trying to get people, get the economy back to work, obviously the uh, the the medical situation that's going on is kind of putting everything back as we see it. Now, there was uh, many uh, people were asking, well, actually, can Harley-Davidson shift their production uh, outside of the United States so that they can start uh, continuing to produce motorcycles? And indeed, even in the United States, the Harley-Davidson heartland, you would say, uh, many of the dealerships now, if they haven't already closed uh, in certain parts, notably, let's say, New York State uh, and also in California, uh, for example, uh, whether they're actually getting deliveries. A lot of uh, deliveries of new motorcycles have stopped. Um, dealerships aren't getting motorcycles or they're getting maybe one or two and obviously the ongoing parts issue was always going to be it's always been an issue uh, all over the globe for the last few months so whether that would actually happen as well uh, and whether that would improve in the coming weeks but right now pretty much it's at a standstill now this is not nothing this is nothing new or this is nothing particular to harley davidson uh you could actually say this for about most motorcycle manufacturers all the smaller ones certainly and in different countries ktm austria uh you know we've got the italian uh ducati motoguzzi is shut down uh we've got uh british manufacturers of all of, of all sizes are shutting down and obviously uh other the big players around the world are either severely restricting or minimizing we hear this morning out of actually japan uh they've actually had a lot more cases of covid19 uh over the the lot over the weekend so they're actually going to be starting to readdress how they're going to be uh, doing things in that country 
and actually whether that will affect the whole manufacturing process, the whole uh, business process. So that, that, you know, will that affect Suzuki, Honda, Kawasaki, Yamaha, so on and so forth. Korea, South Korea have also uh, affected, uh, their, well, they had a big lockdown and they so sought out uh, all their, uh, all the sources of COVID-19 when it first struck. So they've got a very, very low death rate. And so they've just started to reintroduce, relax things now, but it's under very tight controls. But uh, some of their manufacturing will continue as well. So when we say overall manufacturing on a global scale has been severely restricted, it certainly has. Um, we no doubt in my mind that we are heading for a global recession. I know it's all doom and gloom, I'm uh, sorry to say, but that doesn't mean that every single part of the world will be paralyzed for now and however long it's going to continue. We are talking about, you know, companies like say like Harley Davidson having to weather this storm. We already know that they were in trouble anyway in terms of market share and whether they really identify their products with new generations coming through. Uh, but it's actually now whether they can weather this storm and are they going to be like any other business, let's say in the United States, that will be asking for handouts from the federal government. You know, we don't know. Times will tell. But the point is that many people have been asking me, sending me emails and asking me, actually, is it possible that the United, sorry, the, the factories from the United States, as in Harley Davidson, could shift operations to other parts of the world? Uh, let's say whether they could go to some places like South America, you know, could they go to the Far East? Could they actually ramp up production in, uh, in India, you know, where they uh, have been making the street uh, motorcycles? I think they could, they could certainly ramp up productions of those uh, in those particular countries. But again, it really depends on the restrictions of those countries. So let's say in India, that went on total lockdown as well. So nothing's really going to be able to happen there in the Far East, whether now there's going to be a relaxation there or whether they're going to reimpose more restrictions there. But I suppose it really depends from you guys, actually, whether you would want to have a motorcycle that has not been built in the United States. I know for many of you, that's a big thing, um, that you want an American-made motorcycle, whether the parts come from the United States or not, but you want it assembled there. Other uh, motorcycles around the, the world or other people around the world may not be so concerned, as long as it's a Harley Davidson, as long as it's made to the specifications. If it's like a McDonald's type thing, you know, they're all following the same procedure, they're all following the same thing. But for some people, it is, or for a lot of people, I should say, it's, it's a big thing. So, whilst it could be done, this can't be done overnight. And if there is a shortfall in uh, deliveries, let's say, of motorcycles. I don't think there's any way that they, as a company, they're going to be able to outsource this uh, production to their other factories. But also, you've got to think those other factories may will not have the tooling for uh, other types of motorcycles as well. Let's say, for example, India, if they were up and running again, they would only have the tooling for street uh, motorcycles, let's say. Uh, in the Far East, I think they've only got uh, tooling for uh, a few models, certainly not the whole range, not as, as yet as well. But if that were the case, then they could at some point in the future now change that model and actually bring that over to uh, the United States as well. There we go. So I'm being distracted here by uh, by a very uh, a very naughty person here. By the way, anyway, uh, right. Uh, but but here's the thing. Here's the thing. I suppose we've all got to ask ourselves. Looking to the future, if you're going to have a company that has a global presence, like say like Harley Davidson, and uh, th they've got to look at a global resilience or a resilience not only in, within the United States and Canadian market, but also all over the place. So actually, to have all their motorcycles built in one particular factory or a series of factories in, in a country, that they may have to look at this model again. They may have to change things up a little bit. And they may have to say, right, okay, we're going to have uh, all the motorcycles produced, not only in one country, but we're going to have maybe two another two countries around the world. 
that can produce the motorcycles or they're going to have to look at the models at which uh which they're building as well jerry here thank you for this uh jerry says it's a global thing now everything is made everywhere yes that's true in terms of components uh but for many things like harley davidson uh it's very geographic specific uh and certainly if you're an american customer you're probably most likely to want to have the american made in europe uh, right now all the production comes from the united states as well there were rumors whether that actually would continue uh, in the future this is before covid 19 coronavirus uh, whether that will continue in the future whether some of the production from the far east would then come over it's an interesting thing but right now the factories are closed many other motorcycle uh, companies uh, have closed as well uh, and it's um this is an ongoing issue isn't it it's an ongoing issue for everybody uh, but i would say uh, if Harley Davidson are going to survive, just as any other company has survived, I think they're going to probably look at uh, production of motorcycles uh, in, on, or in, or on different continents as well. And, and maybe if they already do have a presence in different countries, then maybe they're going to ramp that up a little bit. But you know, we're we're grabbing at straws here. We're only supposing. We're, th there is no evidence really to support that. Uh, and in the case of Harley Davidson, whether they're going to have the financial clout uh, to be able to do that in the future, obviously stock prices, uh, you know, are taking a massive hit for them as well. So look, it's it's, it's an interesting thing. Uh, it's th they've got to overcome. Uh, the the new labelling, I suppose, of Harley Davidson is really expensive, out of date motorcycles by some people. Uh, you know, I, I think we've got a comment on one of the videos earlier today from somebody who's got a stable of motorcycles, great stable of motorcycles, really love them, uh, but not one of them is a Harley Davidson. They say you know, they used to own Harleys, but they got rid of them. I think the last one was 2014, off the top of my head. But but the interesting thing here uh, is that that it's not they would consider another motorcycle, another Harley Davidson, not based on price and not based on the motorcycle per se, but it's on the value for money. And this is a thing: Are you uh, as a Harley Davidson rider owner uh, or a potential Harley Davidson rider owner? Are you looking at the value at which you're getting? And I suppose that's what Harley Davidson as a company have to really look at now it's the the value that they would uh, give anybody but as i say you know it's it's one of those it's one of those things uh that excuse me have to wet the uh the whistle there um if it, it's going to be one of those things that uh, you know they're all going to be looking at and they you know customer demographics are going to change people's tastes are going to change everybody in the world i think is going to have a mass reflection on this now, you might be uh, watching this video, let's say, in other parts of the world. You know, right here, I'm uh, transmitting this from United Kingdom. You might be in certain parts of the United States, and you're going, you might be thinking, what's all this about? You know, it's, it's you know, it doesn't affect us. It's got nothing to do with us. This is just another media thing. This is just another load of rubbish. Oh, yeah, those people in California, they're overreacting. They're on lockdown. Oh, those people in New York, it's so far away. I live in kansas or texas has got nowhere it's not coming here the problem is it is it, it, it is coming you this is spreading all over the world and you know if the only way that you're never you, you're le, le, hardly likely to get anything like this any kind of contagion any kind of virus is if you live on an on an island that is completely um cut off from the rest of of humanity there is no way anything's getting on there then the chances are very small but if you if it's already in your country then it will sweep across the country unless there are massive restrictions so that's why even if your particular state or your town or your city is not affected by this let's say in the united states for example it, it soon will so that's why there's going to be a wave of reaction and a wave of how this is affecting people at different levels. They're already talking here right now in the UK that this actually will not only go on for three months, this could go on for six months, a year in terms of us having to deal with it and how it will affect our daily lives. So how companies and how people as individuals, how we have to adapt uh, to this in the future. And also, you know, 
you know, what are our tastes going to be uh, in the future? Are we still going to have that taste for, you know, uh, motorcycling, um, things that are non-essential uh, to our existence, but they might be ex essential to our, um, our, our mental states, let's say, our, our passions and all that kind of stuff. Uh, Jerry, if Harley Davidson, if Harley Davidson were priced compared to the cost of parts acquired, they could be sold a lot cheaper. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm sure they would. Look, it'd be very interesting to see. So the, you raise a good point, actually. Where is the most cost coming from in the Harley Davidson or, or, or any manufacturer? Well, let's say Harley Davidson, as we are talking about motorcycles and Harley Davidson. Is it the parts? Because the, maybe the parts are coming from the United States. So is it the parts, the manufacturer of those parts? And is it the, uh, the, the workforce, the labor costs of those parts? Or is it the labor costs of uh, the production or the assembly of those parts uh, in the United States? I think you're going to find that most, most of the higher pricing is going to be uh, in the labor costs as well. And also the production, uh, the unit production cost as well. So whilst they are expensive motorcycles, you probably see because they're uh, built in the United States, they're probably going to have greater uh, labor costs. So a lot of the cost, the higher cost is associated with that. But I'll tell you what, I mean, if they were if they were made in the United Kingdom, let's say, or in Europe, they're, they're probably, or in Scandinavia, for example, well, th that cost would be even higher. So, you know, that's one thing. Um, but you've got to look at possibly what their profit margin is on each individual bike, or are they, have they overextended themselves with too many models and that's why their costs are too much too high because they've just spread themselves too thin over way too many models and what they need to do is cut back cut back on the number of models that they do have and then just work on the the costing of uh, those particular models and then make it a global production process therefore you're going to cut down on unit costs Potentially, look. This is all supposition. We could, we could see something like. I've always thought, whilst Harley Davidson, um, it's it's good that they've been trying to evolve, and it's good that they're trying to bring new motorcycles to the market. I think you know, if if you're going to compare them, let's say, to other manufacturers like the big uh, Japanese Four, for example, in terms of the number of models that they produce, I still I just think that they produce too many. I think they produce too many variations uh, on on the same motorcycle. Whilst it's great for us as a customer to be able to say, "I'll have that one," no, no, I'll have that one, no, I'll have that one. Uh, you know, it gives us something to wonder about. Uh, I think for a company, they're probably going to have to look at this. And under the new uh, leadership, under the new CEO leadership, or acting right now, that Joe Chinzite, and whether you know whether the new CEO coming in, whether they will look at that as well. But possibly, you know, it's going to be a big wake-up call for everybody, uh, the, the way this is affecting everybody around the world anyway. Uh, right, uh, but that, but that's it from Harley-Davidson, as I say. You know, there was some movement that there were, uh, ramblings uh, or, or rumours, I should say, uh, about... Uh, Harley Davidson having to close down for a lot longer, uh, and they may be able to reopen. I think they're being dictated to by obviously health officials, local laws, and uh, state laws and federal laws in the United States. Whether that production could be moved to other parts of the world, <coughs> well, I don't think that's really going to be uh, applicable now. But certainly in the future, that may be uh, what they're looking at. But we'll, we'll we'll have to see. We'll have to see. Okay, the other thing uh, that uh, people uh, were asking me about uh, is, uh, now, Harley-Davidson, as, as a company, uh, they have, they've always uh, run the gauntlet, run a very fine line between producing motorcycles uh, for what they would call performance or what they would call 
uh, for leisure uh, and whether that motorcycling technology that uh, that uh, that generation of engineering is too out of date now because of environmental factors and environmental laws and emissions laws that many countries and continents impose. So then they've had to change that and they've had to change the way they produce their motorcycles to comply with that. And whether, especially with the M8 engine, how it's been able to, to be designed to comply with not only existing emissions, uh, and environmental factors, but also in the for the next the next emission standards that will be coming through, and they're saying actually, or oh, sorry, not they're saying the the question is coming through: Are they making motorcycles now just merely to comply with emission standards, or are they sort of breaking down barriers? Are they able to? Um, you know, produce motorcycles that are going to whet the appetite for people just to keep on riding, as opposed to buying some, uh, you know, namby pamby, uh, you know, green motorcycle. The thing is that they have to, they have to produce these motorcycles that will meet the emission standards. How those emission standards are met is basically through the tuning and obviously the design of the engine and also through uh the the gas flow if you like and also the, the, the types of exhaust now many of you may scoff at this but one of the big issues that's been happening in, in europe uh is this uh knuckling down on uh the types of exhaust that you have what you're allowed to have and how <coughs> that is affecting uh, your legality to be able to ride your motorcycle, but also then Harley Davidson are throwing this back at owners to say, well, actually, if you're messing around with your motorcycle within the first two years, this may affect your warranty. Indeed, if you're not using Harley Davidson parts, then uh, this is going to affect your warranty as well. We may not uh, pay up on that. And this is, you know, made videos on this and there's more videos coming out on this. And I'm sure any other channel you can search for has done lots of things on uh, warranties. Indeed, if you go to a Harley Davidson dealership, it's almost like they want to shy away from talking about uh, warranties or any work that you've done. On, on your motorcycle because it, you've entered this whole gray area of actually you're, you're changing something fundamental on your motorcycle uh the company are going to say well actually we're, we're not gonna we're not going to uh back that up or, or give you any warranty on that because you fundamentally change our motorcycle then the law says and the law enforces out there we're saying well, actually uh, you've changed this motorcycle uh, from what its stock configuration which it complies with emission standards to a motorcycle now that doesn't comply with emission standards or it may not comply with uh you know sound and uh, noise level standards as well so people are being clamped down, people are being stopped, or they were before this whole crisis, here in the UK and around Europe for having noisy exhaust, let's say. You know, even Harley-Davidson riders were being stopped. People were being questioned over their motor, over their exhaust. Uh, is it reliable or is it reliable? Can they reliably say, I should say, that it does meet with the standards? Does it meet with noise levels and everything like that? England has a very interesting thing in terms of emissions and uh, noise levels for exhaust, for example, in that th there isn't actually a prescribed uh, level. Uh, we have an annual roadworthiness check here in the UK called the MOT, uh, which says, and they will give you uh, an advice, an advisory on your annual check to say, okay, your exhaust is too loud or very loud, not too loud, because I can't say too loud because there is no datum to measure it against. But they, you know, they could say where well, it's very loud. However, a a a, um, a police enforcement uh, might come up to you and say, "Well, actually, that is way too loud uh, for what it is." So you kind of enter in this grey area, and then you know, there's a tug of war to say, "Well, actually, something is loud or something isn't too loud. Something is meeting emissions, something it isn't." It's a whole grey area, but. Harley Davidson, as a company, have had to start making motorcycles like that. They've had to start making them all sound anemic, as I like to call. You know, they're not the big roar anymore. Because what uh, I don't think people are the, the new generation, the way society has evolved over the whole globe. I don't think many people like that kind of thing. 
but also uh, the willingness of people to 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 risk warranty and to risk uh, fines from police from not having uh, a a motorcycle that meets those standards uh, that's going to be a big thing so i think you know what we're probably going to see in the future not only of the motorcycle production is changing and it is how it has changed but also how we accessorize our motorcycles how we do upstages all that kind of thing that's possibly going to change you're probably going to see especially especially uh you know after all this crisis pass and how laws react and how uh w whether emission standards react whether noise levels are a challenge as well whether um there will be a tendency to actually not have aftermarket parts at all they only have parts that have been produced and that they do comply with emission standards they do comply with uh noise levels and let's say you know harley davidson they'll produce a particular exhaust muffler right that's the one that we're having and that's the one that we're going to use so you know there's probably going to be a bit more and this is not just for harley davidson this is across all motorcycles whether you have a sports exhaust uh put on there as well in fact many of the the exhaust anyway already say that this is not for road use uh you, you know so you could people try and cover that a bit o over but people have these uh, these exhausts and they and they say well you know you you shouldn't really be having that if you go to switzerland for example as soon as you cross in the border you've got to go through a whole series of things they can impound your motorcycle they fine you uh or they won't even let you in the country let's say if you've got uh, an exhaust that is non-standard in fact, even if you have a standard exhaust and they deem it to be non-standard, you could come and stuck as well. Many people have ridden motorcycles and, uh, over there. Any kind of motorcycle have come and stuck. Uh, even if it's been, this is an interesting thing, even if it's been a manufacturer manufacturer approved uh, accessory part, you've got the part from uh, Harley Davidson, let's say, or from Triumph, or from Suzuki, or whatever it is. If they're saying that's non-standard with the motorcycle, then people have been stopped. Uh, so here we go. Uh, in Jerry, in uh, in France now, we have microphones with cameras, a noisy exhaust, take photo, big fine, and, and points. But well, there we go. That's it. They're already doing it, or they already have done it. So not only is happening in France, I believe in Belgium they were hot on this, in Switzerland uh, and Holland, I believe. I think in Germany they were s starting with this as well. The, the, the times are changing. So I think, you know, as, 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 a, uh, pro uh, as a producer, let's say a manufacturer, let's say Harley-Davidson, they're going to be looking at this and say, well, actually, we, we're already producing bikes that meet the emission standards and meet noise levels. But actually, we've got to look at the, the accessories that we produce that interfere with the powertrain, uh, the engine and the drivetrain and everything. So maybe we're just going to be producing motorcycles, uh, sorry, producing accessories that only deal with the aesthetics. They don't deal with any anything like that. Indeed, actually, we've already seen there's a new generation of people uh, sticking fundamentally with a stock bike. They're not really changing uh, exhaust or, or um, you know, upstaging things like that. They're just changing the, the look of the bike, the aesthetics of the bike, rather than doing any performance upgrades. You know, that's that's what's happening there. Anyway, so um, that was a question that came in as well. So I just wanted to, uh, uh, you know, look, look at that with you. Uh, look, well, I could talk about uh, warranties uh, with you about Harley Davidson warranties, but but one of the big things that I suppose you've got to you've got to factor in, and I, I keep on saying this: if you're concerned about your warranty on your motorcycle, excuse me, wherever you are in the world um the the easiest way to don't be concerned about it is just bide your time just wait don't do anything to your motorcycle wait for two years until the warranty expires then just do it just do um do your work afterwards if you are wanting to do stuff on your motorcycle make sure that if you want it to be warranty compliant that it is warranty compliant 
that it won't be voided under any circumstances. So you've got to make sure with the dealership and also with the uh, Harley Davidson Motor Company themselves, whether any work that you're doing is going to be compliant. It could be anything. It could be anything in the motorcycle. But if it's you're talking about a void, a void in warranty, you've got to make sure that it's uh, okay. Now, this not only covers your initial warranty, but also extended warranty as well. You've got to look at the fine print, what is actually covered, what isn't. And usually you, you look at, you're looking at consumables that isn't covered, you know, brake pads, all that sort of stuff. Clutch uh, it may not be covered. Um, other things that may not be covered, if they deem it to be not their fault, um, there was a case which I brought up, um, uh, the one in Australia, where they had lots of corrosion and pitting on the front forks, the sliders uh, on the motorcycle. And they, the, the Harley Davidson in Australia were saying, well, that's that's your problem. You've ridden it in bad areas. And they're saying, the, the customer said, no, it's not my problem at all. It's your problem, bad finish, whatever. That was an ongoing issue that, you know, that wasn't resolved, I don't believe. And certainly from harley davidson as a as a company and they said it's not their responsibility so you know you've got to be very careful but as i would always say you know if you if you are concerned about any kind of warranty on your motorcycle just just don't do it just don't do anything to it just keep it all make sure that any parts that you put on it are harley davidson screaming eagle parts for example make sure that everything is compliant uh, because if there's any, uh, if, they, if, if they've ever got a reason uh, to void any warranty, they're going to find it. Because what one of the fundamental things that they're going to be looking at as a manufacturer to say is, are we as a company, are we compliant? Are we compliant with all the rules, all the regulations, not only in where we sell most motorcycles, let's say in the case of Harley Davidson in the United States, but also around the world. If, if you ever want to find out what a motorcycle manufacturer has to go through to be compliant in not only one particular country, but in lots of different countries, go search out Arch Motorcycle. Uh, you know, the Keanu Reeves uh, and Gard Hallinger uh, motorcycles are from, uh, from California. Okay, great motorcycles, love them, but obviously very expensive and all that kind of stuff. But if you do a bit of research, and, and you'll you'll find a couple of videos, a few interviews, when they talk about each component, each in the evolution of their KRGT uh, ones, for example, their model and the three models that they've got, how to make them compliant, not only across the, the United States and across the individual states, but also around the world as well and in Europe, and how many things they're looking at. That. Go search that out because that's really you know that's really interesting. Okay, uh, right, so let me just uh, get rid of that, just get rid of that. Okay, so uh, anyway, I just wanted to bring you uh, a bit of that news anyway. So look, there's lots of stuff going on in the world right now, and there's lots of things going on. I mean, the other uh, the other question that came up, and, and I've got quite a few comments uh, recently, is about uh, riding motorcycles right now uh, under restrictions. Uh, let's say if we're under lockdown, we're under lockdown here in the UK. And um, so people have been asking me, so how are you able to, to still ride your motorcycle? Well, I'm able, what, one of the things is right now on my days off, because uh, I am still able to work, I'll get onto that in a moment. One of the things that are, uh, when I'm at home, Unless uh, when I'm not working, if I'm not going to specifically get medicine or food, let's say, uh, then I'm just at home. I'm just like everybody else. I'm not doing anything. I'm not. Uh, I'm exercising once a day. I'm exercising at home. I'm doing this kind of stuff. Uh, I'm uh, preparing for the future. I'm tinkering about in my in my workshop, but I'm not actually riding my motorcycle on my days off. Uh, now let's because uh, I've got a car as well. So if, if I'm going to go to the shop, I'll probably unless I'm going to go and pick up just one small item, then I, I, I take my motorcycle. Uh, but otherwise, I take the car, whatever, and go and do a shop. Now, if I'm right when I do go to work, I am uh, designated a key worker, an essential worker for the job that I do. Uh, then I will 
most likely use my motorcycle uh, to do that. And then whilst I'm on, on route, on whichever route I take to my place of work or on my way back from work, then I might do a motor vlog and discuss a few things. I might quickly pull over and just, uh, you know, do something like that. So I'm not, I'm still complying with what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm not doing a leisurely ride, a social ride. I'm actually going from my house of place of uh, where I live to a place of work and back again. So people have been asking me, can I go out for a social ride? And you say, well, actually, no, because really you shouldn't be doing any essential traveling. You shouldn't be going anywhere unless uh, you have, uh, you're going to work or going out for food shopping or um, uh, med medical shopping. This is essential travel only. Uh, now, apparently, uh, I, I've heard uh, one person, uh, I, I won't mention the name, contacted me and said, okay, uh, the other day, uh, I, I, they said they were an essential worker, they were a key worker, and they were stopped by the police, and the police told them that they shouldn't be riding their motorcycle to and from places of work, whatever, uh, just in case they have an accident. Well, in my eyes, uh, first of all, there's two things here. First of all, the police do not make the law, they enforce the law. That's as simple as that. So th there is no law that's in, in our country right now under the current uh, lockdown. And watch my other video when I talked about whether, uh, whether governments have the right to stop you riding your motorcycle. Because if they change the law and they say, right, you're not allowed to ride motorcycles during this period, okay, that's fair enough. But right now, under lockdown, you say, you know, somebody, a police officer is saying to somebody, you should not be riding a motorcycle because if you have an accident, then you'll have an increased burden on the NHS. Well, for me, that that's not uh, acceptable. That's not acceptable at all because you could apply that same logic to anything. People could be driving a car, they have an accident. People could be uh, doing something at home, they could have an accident. People could be, you know, whatever, slip in the bath and, and have an accident. So, so that's, you know, doesn't make any sense whatsoever. In fact, the biggest thing, what they're saying right now is for people to be very careful at home because in what you're doing at home in terms of doing DIY and all this sort of stuff, because you might have an accident that, you know, might have to go to hospital or you may not be able to go to hospital. You might not be able to deal with uh, minor uh, injuries because of uh, the hospitals being overwhelmed with COVID, uh, you know, coronavirus uh, patients and all that sort of stuff. But the law as it st stands is that you can use any mode of transport it doesn't actually stipulate there's no there's no restriction on whatever mode of transport that you choose to use to go to and from a place of essential work uh whatever it is if you are a key worker if you're an essential worker you know whatever if you are still using that mode of transport whatever it is if you're on foot if you're on a bicycle a motorcycle a car a van or whatever to do that or if you need to go shopping or if you need to uh you know do something like that then, then that's fine. But for any uh, police officer to say under this current uh, restrictions, current lockdown, to say you should not be riding a motorcycle, it's completely wrong. That is complete, and that should not be. The, one of the problems that you, you may have, whilst everybody, and I, I, I sincerely say this, if, you, if, you're not, if, you're not, if you don't have to make a, uh, a journey, then don't. You shouldn't be making a journey. I, I completely agree with that. But if you are having to make a journey for one of the, the reasons, then you, the, you you make it by whatever means you feel is appropriate. The big problem is, is that if people, anybody in society, start pointing the finger at you or anybody without foundation, say, you can't do this, you can't do that. I would say, well, actually, uh, there is no law to say I can't do this, and your opinion uh, means nothing, uh, you know, because it's just an opinion. Uh, so whilst there were good intentions, I am sure from anybody or a police officer saying you should not be riding your motorcycle just in case there was an accident, for example, uh, they have no foundation for that. And, that you know, they should check their attitude towards people and this is not only against the police this is against anybody in society you've kind of got we've got to be careful how we're managing people and how we're going to be speaking to people over the next uh, few weeks as well
uh, and certainly uh, in uh, across the world as well, because you might have a, a reaction from people. If people are going to get frustrated, if people are going to be, uh, you know, let's say they can't get food, they haven't got any money for whatever reason, then obviously if they're spoken to in a really bad and abrupt way from the police, and also if they're being told to do something, that actually there's no law to say that they have to do that, that you know that you're going to have pro you're going to have problems in your hands. It's already started in Italy, unfortunately. There's a, a few th uh, incidents already happening. So you know, whilst governments and you know the, the local governments and maybe the police and maybe the military have got to come in and actually support. It's just all about supporting the community. This is not about you know saying you can't do this, you can't do that. But the community have got to do as they're told, also, and they've got to do what is right. You know, so there's, there's, I'm sure there will be uh, people out there of all walks of life who will try and give you false information and tell you to do something that actually you don't have to do. The, the people that you need to listen to are, you know, the health professionals, the, you know, the, the government, what you're being told to do officially and how you should do it. I've no doubt there will be more restrictions in it. But in terms of modes of transport to do officially recognized uh, journeys right now, there is no reason why you, you can't do and you could you could do on any form of uh, transport. And any way to say that you can't is actually talking you know nonsense. It's totally wrong. Totally wrong. You know, as I say people, you know, whatever it is, people have to be uh, free to be able to make their own decisions with the guidelines or within the restrictions but they can't be dictated to and they can't be told to do something under false pretenses you know we can't have people get and getting off on a power trip for example and uh telling people uh oh yeah you've got to do this because i say so uh okay we're on a slippery slope there and and that's when you will get reactions unfortunately so you know there is a, a social responsibility from us all from us as normal people within the public from us who work within the emergency services from those from within government at a national and local level and also especially from law enforcement they have to enforce the law but they also have to make sure that law abiding citizens and this is what uh, the key point here i'm trying to make if you are law abiding citizens if you have not done anything wrong then the police have to treat you with the utmost respect and the utmost courtesy uh, at all times you cannot let this descend into an us and them situation because all of a sudden people react to it and you or you may already see it and the longer this goes on the more sensitive that we all have to be to how other people are now if you're committing a crime let's say for example or you're for flagrantly disobeying uh, the rules or that will keep us all safe then yes of course you have to be dealt with but if you're not doing anything wrong or you're doing what you're supposed to be doing but you're just doing it in a different manner then obviously you know you have to think about that Right. Anyway, so those are the points that were raised uh, this week. I uh, say, so, you know, if you want to, uh, you know, leave your comments afterwards. I, I appreciate that not many people are, are watching this right now, but maybe you'll watch it later. If you, if you want to leave your comments later, uh, please do. Let us know what you think on those points about Harley Davidson, about social mobility and all, all that sort of stuff. The future of motorcycles, the future of motorcycling. What do you think about that? Right. Who is up for uh, a quiz, a motorcycle quiz? Yeah. Let me let me do that. And uh, so, as I say, if you want to do that, join in the chat uh, later, uh, leave your comments and ask your questions at any point. Not only just on this video, uh, leave them in the comments, but send uh, your emails uh, via the website, you know, revelatoralpha.com. It's in the ticker tape thing there as well. Like, share, subscribe, all that kind of stuff. Tell your friends about the channel, all the other stuff, all the other videos. Before I get onto the site as well, on, onto the quiz, I will say something else as well, that uh, it's it's actually been very hard, I've got to say, I'm sure for all of us, but it's very hard to keep on producing the, the content on a daily basis and maybe up in it for two or three videos a day. Um, I've, I've tried to do as much as I can, and I could continue to do it as well. That One of the problems is, is about uh, looking to the future seeing how many I could do 
what I could do, what other restrictions will be placed on me uh, in the future as well. We already got a message this morning from YouTube and from Facebook that they may not be able to handle the amount of traffic that's coming through. Uh, so, you know, there might be service uh, disruptions as well. We just don't know right now. Um, but, what, I mean, one of the things that uh, I've been questioning, whether I should release as many videos as I do, or should I cut back? And I've been thinking about it, not just recently, but for a long time as well. I really enjoy producing the videos. I really enjoy talking to you. I really enjoy trying to bring you as much information as possible. But I think there comes a point possibly where if the people aren't watching the videos, um, I'm not getting the, the 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 views that I would like to get from the videos. Then maybe I need to rethink how I'm making the videos on what subjects, and and, and maybe you know because ultimately I want the channel to grow to to get to more people so that you know we you know the information can get out there and share as well and we could all you know have different conversations and share different experiences as well. So whilst there are videos already planned until the 20th of April, that's already done. Uh, but as of two days ago, I've stopped making videos uh, for now uh, or any new videos. I'll continue with occasional live streams as well just to bring you any new info or any, uh, or any questions that have been sent to me or any comments that have been raised as well i'll try and address those uh in the um in here in, in the live streams uh but <clears throat> and also make that available on the podcast as well try and make it more of a topical show as well i say i am working in the background to start thinking about different types of videos now uh, for the future uh so maybe by the start of may uh i may change the frequency of the amount of videos that i make I'm not saying I'm going to go to, to one a week, but maybe two or three a week, something like that, uh, and then we'll see how it goes. It really depends what happens, obviously, between now and then and what sort of things that I can discuss. And maybe so it would be more of a live show um, channel for a while or, or, or maybe a little bit more. But, again, it really depends on the, the types of uh, – uh, how many views I get, and also who, uh, what the comments are, what the feedback is as well. So let us know. Let us know about that. That'd be really appreciated. Okay, right, enough of that. But say so things are going on in the background. You still got a lot more content coming, uh, a lot more rides coming. Uh, but to say, I haven't made a couple of videos for a couple of. I haven't made videos for a couple of days. I probably won't uh, for the next uh, week or so. I'm going to start really th brainstorming, thinking what I can do, and then go from there. Anyway, right, let's get on to this motorcycle quiz. Right, so what I'll do, I'll kind of leave uh, five seconds or so, and then, or 10 seconds uh, between each one, and then uh, you can put your answer in the comments below. Right, so uh, here's, now, should I give you the answers? Should I give the answer? I'll tell you what, I'll give you the answers at the end of the quiz. Let's do that, right. The first question is, which motorcycle did Marlon Brando ride in the wild one? Which motorcycle did Marlon Brando ride in the wild one? Do you know that? Does anybody know that? <laughs> okay, next question. Next question. What does diner mean? And where did it first originate from? What does diner mean, and where did it first originate from? Okay, here's the next question. In what year did Victory Motorcycles start? In what year did Victory Motorcycles start? This is like your ultimate pub quiz, isn't it? But we're not in pubs, and we're sat at home, or you're watching this later. Okay, next question. How did Indian motorcycles get their name? How did Indian motorcycles get their name? And next question. Which, there are 10 questions here, by the way. There are only 10 questions. Which was the first Japanese motorcycle to win a TT race? Which was the first Japanese motorcycle to win a TT race? That's an interesting one, actually. Yeah. Which was the first 
Moto Guzzi motorcycle. So for all you Moto Guzzi fans out there, which was the very first production motorcycle from Moto Guzzi? When what? So the next question: When was Ducati formed? When was Ducati formed? What were they producing? All that kind of stuff. But ultimately, when was when was Ducati formed? And if a bonus point for you, can you tell me when they produced their first ever motorcycle? And what was it called? Okay, next question. Which was the first 1000cc BMW motorcycle and when was it released? Or when was it sold? First sold. Okay, next motorcycle. Which manufacturer has won the MAA, sorry, the AMA Road Racing Championships since it started in 1976? Which manufacturer has won the most AMA Road Racing Championships since it started in 1976? I've got an extra the in there. That's why I got a bit tongue-tied there. Let me just uh, hold on. Okay, so the next question is, let's get rid of that. Yeah, so we go back to there. Which manufacturer has won the most AMA Road Racing Championships uh, since it started in 1976? And the last question, here we go, last question. Which motorcycle a racer has won the most, I've done it again, AMA Road Racing Championships since 1976? There we go. Save that. There we go. Play that one. Right. Which manufacturer has won? And then the last one. Which motorcycle racer has won the most AMA road racing championships since 1976? Well, there we go. So those are your questions uh, for today. I uh, hope you enjoyed that. And uh, go away and do your uh, research or... Maybe you just want to stick around for a little bit longer and hear the uh, answers. Anyway, but look, I'm going to ramble on a little bit. But I just want to say thanks very much to everybody uh, who may be watching this in the future. Those of you who joined in as well. I didn't advertise this. I'm going to kind of do this flash mob type um, surprise uh, live streams uh, for you as well. But so I am going to try and do them uh, on a regular basis, especially when I'm here and I'm not required out there to go and uh, go out into the world and, and do my bit um on my uh, on my essential work and my key work so whatever so if i'm here i'm going to try and do a live show for you come up with different things if you want me to try and research things for you discuss things please email those in as well uh and uh you know th thanks for all the pictures that you're sending in as well of your motorcycle and different modifications that you've done uh i really appreciate that but as i say as always please like share subscribe leave those comments below uh and say check out the website revelatoralf.com click on the links in the description uh down below all that kind of stuff if you want to come on one of the live shows here and uh be interviewed and talk about bikes and what you're up to by all means, please do. Get in touch uh, via the website, and I'll be able to send you a link uh, for the next show as well. And you can come and join me, and we can have a little chat as well. But anyway, uh, but say, so, you know, leave your comments and, uh, you know, let everybody know about uh, this uh, channel, Revelator Alpha, and all, all the videos, you know, and get them to, you know, look at all the archive as well, uh, especially for all the how to videos, uh, all the all the discussion videos, all that kind of stuff. Because, uh, you know, that's where all the info is there. That's where all the archive stuff is there. So check out the playlists as well. Loads of playlists uh, on the channel. If you go to the home page on the channel you see the playlist there lots of info there as well so i'm sure you'll be able to find uh, stuff for you as well right okay shall we get uh these questions uh up again right so which motorcycle did marlon brando uh ride in the wild one and the answer is a 1950 Triumph Thunderbird 6T. That's what uh, he wrote. That's right. Okay. Uh, next question. What does Dyna mean and where did it first originate? 
Okay, so diner uh, means dynamic, powerful, and fast. And that's what Harley Davidson wanted to try and introduce to uh, their line and make their bikes sound more powerful and dynamic and all that sort of stuff. And it's actually first uh, seen as a name on the diner glide. On the diner glide. Okay. So the next question In which year did Victory Motorcycles start? Well, they started in 1997, but their first production bike was sold in 1998. I really liked uh, uh, Victory Motorcycles, by the way. They are. Okay. Uh, how did Indian Motorcycles get their name? How did Indian motorcycles get their name? Well, uh, originally, uh, Indian was uh, a company called Hendy uh, Manufacturing Company, and they built uh, bicycles in the late 1800s. And their American Indian bicycle was shortened to Indian, uh, which then became the company name in 1901. It became just Indian uh, because it was seen as a more of a marketing brand name that they could sell their bicycles into different markets around the world as well but that's when it's adopted and so on so it became the indian uh motorcycle company if, if you like yeah, from uh 1901 okay next question which was the first japanese motorcycle to win a tt race okay so the first japanese motorcycle uh in 1963 ito uh became the first japanese rider to win a japanese motorcycle suzuki uh to win a race at the Iron Man tt when he won the 50 cc ultra lightweight tt race so it was a suzuki uh that won the first uh japanese the first japanese uh, motorcycle to win a tt race okay uh, next question, which was the first Moto Guzzi uh, motorcycle? Okay, so after the first GP500 four-valve prototype, uh, the Guzzi Parodi, uh, Moto Guzzi's first mass-produced motorcycle came to the market in 1921. The first official Moto Guzzi was named Normale, normal. OK, um, uh, but, but with its an innovative, innovative uh, robust and reliable design and performance, it was anything but normal, uh, especially compared to the contemporary motorcycles of the roaring 20s. So the first Moto Guzzi was called Normal. <laughs> what a name. Normale. Normale. OK, right. Next question. When was Ducati formed? When was Ducati formed? Okay, so Ducati, it was uh, in uh, 1926 when an Italian named Antonio Cavalieri Ducati and his three sons founded a company in uh, in the name of Società Scientifica Radio Brevetti uh, Ducati in uh, Bologna to produce vacuum tubes, condensers and other radio uh, components, right? Farinelli mounted a propulsion mo motor on a bicycle, but the company he worked with, Siata, uh, couldn't handle demand for the bike. Ducati stepped in as a manufacturer of the Cucciolo. The Cucciolo was uh, one of those first bikes, which became very successful upon its release in 1946. In, nine, in July 1949, Ducati manufactured the first complete motorcycle, the Ducati 60, the Ducati 60. So uh, it was uh, it was the the founding of uh, the company was 1926, but they they produced their first motorcycle in 1949, and that was called the Ducati 60. Okay, next question: Which was the first 1,000 cc BMW motorcycle, and when was it released? Okay, so the first. Uh, when the R75 line of motorcycles was introduced in 1975, and uh, this included a 1000cc model called the R100S, and that was released in 1977. So the R100S was the first 1000cc motorcycle and from 1977 from BMW. Okay, uh, so that's that one. Right. Next question. Which manufacturer has won the most AMA road racing championship since it started in 1976? 
And the answer to that is, would you believe, Suzuki. And they've got 14 titles. Suzuki, 14 titles. Okay. And the last question here for all you pot pickers, uh, which motorcycle racer has won the most AMA road racing championships since 1976? And the answer is the legend, the legend, Matt Maladin. Uh, seven titles, all on Suzuki Yoshimura uh, motorcycles. So, uh, yeah, uh, Suzuki won 14 titles. Well, seven of those can come from Matt Maladin. Uh, and what uh, a marvellous uh, chap he is. Right, there we go. Let's close that down. So there we go. Uh, get rid of that. So I hope you hope you found I hope you found that entertaining. That little pub quiz uh, right at the end. Uh, I've been on for an hour. I think that's enough of me, don't you? I would say, but you can listen to this on the podcast uh, later on when I sort of download this and upload there. Uh, uh, and uh, say, we'll listen to it at your leisure. Uh, but say, if you want to appear on the show, if you want to come on and watch more uh, videos, please do. If you want to ask any questions, send them in via the website as well. Let us know what uh, what you're up to, what you want to talk about. And uh, I'll try my best uh, with everything. But I say there will be changes to the channel uh, in the future the sort of frequency of videos that I produce. There's lots more videos coming in. Hopefully, they'll keep you uh, entertained uh, in these uh, troubling times as well. Uh, give you something just to think about rather than uh, all, everything else that we've got to think about right now. A welcome distraction, I suppose. That, that's uh, what we're looking at. But anyway, I hope you... Uh, hope you uh, I hope you stay well, keep well, keep yourselves fit, keep yourselves healthy, mentally healthy, physically healthy as well. And uh, catch you on the next video uh, on live stream or whatever it is coming very soon. But all I can say is please like, share, subscribe, leave those comments, check out that website, revelatorhealth.com, and uh, click on the bell next to the subscribe button uh, for all the future videos, all the live streams. You will get notified it straight away. All right. Catch you again. Ta-da. Peace. Ta-da.